Um, we've seen speakers talk about state-by-state -state renewable portfolio standards as a driver for development of renewable technology. And so I think from this, it should be clear to all of us in this room that moving forward in this area, reducing our carbon footprint, reducing the inefficient use of fossil fuels, the inefficient consumption of fossil fuels, clearly cannot just be market-driven, cannot just be driven by a desire on our parts to do good. It's clearly going to require policies at both the federal and state level to help bring about change in a timely fashion and promote development and implementation. Now, last night, just in thinking about today's meeting, I decided to take a look at the websites of the major candidates for U.S. president. And I took a look at 10 of them. I won't tell you who I decided were the 10 major candidates for president, but I took a look at 10 of the sites last night from both parties, and I found that 9 out of 10 of them listed energy as one of the leading issues that they were hoping to address in their campaign and their presidency. Nine out of 10. Now, of course, my immediate reaction was I was disappointed that it wasn't 10 out of 10. But still, nine out of 10, I think, is a change from what we've seen in many of the years past and tells us that there is recognition at the national level that we need to have federal policies promoting the development of um, alternative energy technologies. And so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker in this, this afternoon's panel, and that's Mr. Jason Grumet, who is the founder and president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is led by former Senate Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, who's here with us today, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. In addition, Jason is the leader of the National Commission on Energy Policy, and it's in that capacity that he's going to be speaking to us today on their efforts to help promote a bipartisan effort to address oil security, energy independence, and address the issue of climate change. Please join me in welcoming Jason Grumet. Jason. I love the irony of the mics not working in an engineering school as an environmental studies major myself. Um, well, <laughs> thank you, Joe and Lee, for the opportunity to, to come here. And thanks, all of you, for uh, coming back so quickly from lunch. It's the, the most uh, responsive conference I've ever been at. Um, so what I want to do, and I, I got about half an hour or so uh, to do it, is to tell you just a little bit about what the National Commission on Energy Policy is, as well as the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is now kind of our parent organization. Um, I don't believe that there's such a thing as objectivity, but I do believe transparency is an important goal uh, in all of these exercises. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of where we're coming from. And then as the speech behind me uh, suggests, really focus on what are the two structural challenges to US energy policy, and those are obviously climate change and oil security. And what I'll try to do is talk through you know, what those kind of key issues are, um, think about some of the new coalitions that are forming and that need to form and then really think through some of the strategic choices in the political context of what is happening and, and not happening right now uh, in Washington. Um, so, uh, all right, that you know, serves, serves me right for making fun of the engineering school. All right, how's that, a little better? All right, so let me just start off and give you a little bit of a sense of what, uh, first off, the National Commission on Energy Policy is and aspires uh, to accomplish. About five or six years ago, a number of big philanthropies uh, came together and had the epiphany that energy policy was both stuck and crowded. You know, we were careening between Anwar and Kyoto. There wasn't a lot else being discussed in the middle. But at the same time, there were hundreds of organizations working on it. And this, led primarily by the, the Hewlett Foundation effort, started to kind of ask, well, how could they enter the space in a way that would be constructive? and came to the conclusion that the, the best option would be to put together a group that was essentially so bizarrely diverse, both diverse in terms of expertise and history, but also in terms of political affiliation, that if the group could come together and agree to something meaningful, it would essentially disorient Washington long enough to hear some, some new ideas, but also a lot of good old ideas that had been kind of languishing there for the better part of the last decade. And you know, the effort um, was to really be bipartisan, as opposed to nonpartisan or proto, trans, metapartisan, you know, kind of the Schwarzenegger view. And if you're as famous and wealthy as you know, God himself, you can be transpartisan or postpartisan. If you're a second term congresswoman outside of Cleveland, you actually need to care a little more about you know, the, the two party system and what congressional leadership uh, is gonna suggest that uh, you think about. And our goal was to put together an effort that had the kind of scholarship of uh, a think tank, but the strategic 
and kind of tactical views and efforts of a more aggressive advocacy organization. Our experience with that um, was that it worked pretty well. As Senator Daschle, I'm sure, uh, can tell you, there's no lack of information in Congress. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. There's a fire hose of information. Senators and members of Congress don't get the opportunity often to reflect carefully on a 30-page document, let alone a three-page document. And in fact, even the Senate and House staff rarely have that kind of time. So much of what matters in influencing the policy discussion is the transitive property of trust. Who's talking? And the ability to walk into a Senate office with the head of the Natural Resource Defense Council's energy lead and the conservative CEO of an oil company and have the two of them say the same thing had that kind of productively dumbfounding effect. And it enabled us to build a series of relationships and have some um, active influence on the, to the 2005 energy bill, which uh, I'll note was called the Comprehensive 2005 Energy Bill. Because about once a decade, we pass a, a big bill. That comprehensive bill cleared away a lot of the brush, but it did not, in any direct or meaningful way, address climate change or oil security, which, you know, Kind of, a, kind of a tough thing to, to recognize. What then happened was uh, Hurricane Katrina. And so you know, we had climate change and oil security as these two big elephants in kind of a dim room, and the light got flicked on. And it became very clear that we could not wait another decade before we re-engaged the energy issue. And we have been having an active energy debate really for the last five years, and I'm assuming for the next 50 years. It is, it is an issue now that is chronically part in a very productive way of the congressional agenda. And so what I want to do now is kind of you know, dig in a little bit to those key challenges of oil and climate and you know, share some thoughts about what our organization has promoted and what we've learned um, along the way. And so let me start out on oil and mention something that may have been mentioned last night. Every single US president since Richard Nixon has deeply and profoundly committed his administration to energy independence. Yet every single administration has not only failed to achieve that, I think, mythical goal, but actually gone in the other direction. And so the first point of entry to this discussion is to say, well, what, what, you know, what's going on with that? Um, and let me suggest a couple of things. The scale of the problem is fundamentally disassociated from the timing of our political process. We have tremendous negative momentum in the system. We have been using oil for 100 years. Our economy is built around it. We use 20 million barrels of oil a day, which is kind of a hard statistic to understand. But think about 150 billion gallons of gasoline a year. Massive scale. We have sunk infrastructure. It takes a while to change things around. And so there, it requires a long-term commitment to a solution, which is often at odds with the imperatives of people in elective office. And I've had a number of opportunities to meet with uh, elected officials who absolutely understand the problem, passionate about the problem. And they say, what can we do to reduce our energy dependence by 30% in the next 10 years? And you know, you can't. It's not like putting 100,000 cops on the street. You don't get tangible benefits between the time you take a tough vote that angers a lot of people and your next election. And that doesn't mean that people are not still committed to the cure, um, but it changes the dynamic. The country tends to careen from trance to hysteria on energy policy, depending upon the price of gasoline. Neither posture is particularly productive from which to legislate. Trance is obviously trance. Hysteria is people wanting to go home to their local gas station and making a speech. Um, a number of them got caught then jumping in their SUVs and driving away, which <laughs> didn't, didn't make for good press. Um, it, it's also important um, to just think about this goal of energy independence for a while. 